Clinical Actors Moderator. I'm sorry that it was so hot, as you know, this, uh, this is a tendency in this room um, where we can bring some water down so that, that you can uh, get a glass of water if you get too hot. So, um, our first panelist tonight is Cécile Adri, who is a professor of French at Stanford University. She's a specialist of French Renaissance literature as well as contemporary French politics and culture and studies in particular the political discourse of the far right and of French presidential campaigns. Needless to say, she's had plenty of material to work with recently, and her two most recent books are re very relevant to tonight's discussion. She published Marine Le Pen, Prise au Mot, Décryptage du Nouveau Discours Fontiste in 2015, decrypting the new rhetoric of Marine Le Pen and the National Front using digital humanities and textual analysis. And her newest book is Qui dit quoi, Décoder le discours des présidentiables, who says what? Decoding the discourse of French presidential candidates. We have copies of both of these books for sale, thanks to Albertine um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the lobby outside. Much of her work focuses on notions of nationhood, identity, and on cultural and political constructions and mythologies of Frenchness at critical junctures of French, France's cultural history. <coughs> in addition to her scholarly work, Cécile Ladry is a regular media commentator on French political news and a contributor to the Atlantic, The Nation, The New Yorker's blog, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and other publications. Um, our second panelist is Arthur Goldhammer, who has been a student and observer of French politics since 1968. He is a gifted and prolific translator and has translated more than 130 books from French to English, including Tokyo's Democracy in America and Thomas Piketty's uh, Capital in the 21st Century, of which I think we have just one copy um, for sale outside. He's also written dozens of articles on topics ranging from um, articles on Alain Corbin, Jean Renoir, and Bertrand to articles about translation, historiography, and the fate of democracy and of the left in France and the United States. Art Goldhammer also chairs the seminar for visiting scholars at Harvard Center for European Studies and is a member of the editorial board of French Politics, Culture, and Society and of the, the Tocqueville Review. <coughs> But one of the main reasons that Emmanuel Sada wanted to invite him to join us for this panel is that he's, he also writes a blog called French Politics, an American Observer Comments on French Politics, in which he's been closely following and commenting on the French presidential election. Our third panelist is Stephen Lauer, who is a U.S. correspondent for Le Monde in New York since 2013, with a particular focus on economic and financial topics. He began working at Le Monde in 1994 and has spent most of his journalistic career there, including his in as director from 2008 to 2011. He studied at the um, Institut d'études politiques in Toulouse and the Center for University Journalism Studies in Strasbourg. And he's also the author of a study of the Renault automobile company called Renault Une Révolution Française. Stéphane will be leaving New York to return to Paris um, this summer with his family. So. We'd like to thank him for his service on behalf of, of, of New York and the United States for the moment for the past uh, several years. Emmanuel Sada will be serving as moderator tonight. She's an associate professor of French and history at Columbia and the director of the Center for French and Francophone Studies. Her research focuses primarily on the history of the French Empire in the 19th and 20th century with a particular interest in the law. Her first book, Les Enfants de la Colonie, Les Métis de l'Empire Français entre Suggestion et Citoyenneté, was published in France in 2007 and translated into English in 2012. And her current projects include a historiographical book focusing, uh, reflecting on French and European colonization as a history of the present, and a project on law and violence in, Al in Algeria and France in the 19th century. I'd also like to thank the Alliance Program for co-sponsoring um, this event with us tonight and thank Alessia Les Bureau in particular, um, the director of the Alliance Program, until June, sadly, she's going to be leaving us. So um, thank you also so much for your wonderful collegiality. Um, please join me in welcoming our, our panelists. Thank you. Instead of having three different presentations and then a general discussion, I think uh, there is enough 
intention and passion in the next election to justify a slightly more um, interactive format. So we're going to, to divide the, the next hour in three different themes. Uh, first, we're going to analyze a little further the first round, the results of the first round. Then we're going to speak about what is uh, likely to happen next uh, next Sunday, next seven, as you all know, there will be um, the second round of the elections and uh, Macron and, and uh, Marine uh, Le Pen, Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen are going to um, uh, uh, face each other. And then we're also going to try to speak a little more, uh, a little about the uh, but what is likely to happen after my seventh? We have kind of an idea of what will happen on Sunday. Uh, it's a little more than a hope. It's a, there is like some statistical uh, backing of the idea that Macron is a likely winner. So we need to think about uh, what will happen uh, after my seventh. So this is this is how it's going to be organized. So I'd like to uh, start by asking all our panelists to say a little more about the difference between this past Sunday, the, uh, uh, April 23rd, uh, 2017, and the uh, result after, or the result of the April 21st, 2002 elections. As you know, 15 years ago, uh, on April 21st, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen came in second place. He made about a little more than us, almost 17%. Thank you. And uh, that was, you know, an enormous crisis. People of my generation were, you know, we were, you know, completely uh, 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 devastated by this. And uh, this time, um, everybody was expecting Le Pen to be in the second round. Actually, she did a little less than uh, the polls had given her in the past uh, few months. And everybody was kind of relieved just <laughs> because of that. So what has happened to France in France in the past 15 years? Uh, the uh, uh, Le Pen, Marine Le Pen strategy of de-demonization work, work, uh, that it worked. Uh, is this a case of Le Penisation des Esprits? Are we all used now to that uh, set of uh, ideas in France? Can you comment a little about the different atmosphere 15 years apart? Maybe you want to start? Um, indeed, I think the difference is the reaction to the results rather than the result themselves since it's the first time in history that the National Front won more than 7 million of French votes in a presidential election and in any election. Um, and um, so I guess your question is why are people not in the streets? <coughs> some of them were today in the streets of Paris, but some of the slogans today in the streets were neither Marie nor Macron, a very different tone than uh, 15 years ago. Um, I think there are uh, external factors and internal factors to this um, uh, state of events, and external internal to the National Front itself. Um, an easy um, change uh, to consider is the change in leadership and rhetorical strategy adopted by Marine Le Pen. Um, it is true that we have to remember that Jean-Marie Le Pen was called the devil of the Republic and um, had been demonized for uh, legitimate reasons and he participated in his own demonization but it meant that when he um, got into the second round in 2002 it was um, the impossible um, happening suddenly. Um, today, people have been used to Marine Le Pen. She has played uh, a tender card almost with the media. She has tamed down the rhetoric of the National Front. She has avoided mostly, uh, if I were to sum up my book, on the comparison between Marine Le Pen and Jean-Marie Le Pen. She has eliminated from the National Front's rhetoric everything that has to do with race and with anti-Semitism, at least from her own words. If you follow the press, you would have noticed that uh, the person who was supposed to replace her um, for a, a few weeks at the head of the National Front while she was running, Jean-François Jacques, uh, had to be dismissed because he had uh, denied the existence of the Holocaust um, 10 years ago. So it's still there, but it's not in Marine Le Pen's own words. So this would be the um, the reasons internal to the National Front strategy itself or that would account for uh, a better reception of um, 
its candidates and uh, its success. But they're also, and they might be less visible but much more important, external factors. And these would be the fact that a great deal of the rhetoric of the National Front that used to be uh, considered um, um, xenophobic or racist 15 years ago as being adopted by other political personalities. Um, among them, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, for some part, is responsible for um, legitimizing um, a, a number of rhetorical cliches, for instance, the association of Roma population and um, insecurity, criminality, and um, um, delinquence in general, um, and also for raising the issue of immigration versus national identity and establishing a minister that would associate the two terms as if there's a question here that needs to be addressed. Um, but he is not the only one, and actually, um, as recently as the of the January uh, Socialist Party primary, you had uh, Manuel Valls talking about Asistana, uh, talking um, some of his um, allies um, talk, talking about islamo gauchist to criticize Benoît Hamon, and uh, Arnaud Montbourg, who is also from the Socialist Party. Um, using the, th uh, the phrase UMPS, so is, this is a con conglomerate of the UMP party, the right-wing party and the socialist party, which has been forged and coined and used by the National Front for years. And these are just instances by which you've had a circulation of the National Front rhetoric and sometimes ideas throughout the political spectrum, which makes it much more difficult for people suddenly the evening of the first one to say, this is horrible and it should never have happened. Je pense qu'il y, y a deux éléments pour comprendre ce qui s'est passé euh, entre 2002 et, et, et 2017. Le premier d'ordre euh, historique, c'est-à-dire euh, qu'il faut se souvenir ce qui s'est passé le 21 avril euh, 2002 lorsque Jacques Chirac euh, remporte euh, l'élection présidentielle. Ok, so I am going to translate uh, for Stefan, or rather summarize. Uh, he's going to focus on two elements, uh, starting with the historic uh, aspect uh, of Chirac's victory in 2000. Jacques Chirac remporte l'élection avec 82% des suffrages. Et il faut se poser la question qu'est-ce qu'il fait de ce plébiscite euh, dans, dans, les, dans les mois qui suivent. Ok, so uh, Chirac won in the second round in 2002 with 82% of the vote. And uh, uh, Stefan is posing the question, what did he do with that mandate that he received? Et qu'est-ce qu'il a fait Il a nommé un, un Premier ministre de droite. Euh, il a rassemblé euh, la droite traditionnelle avec le centre pour former euh, l'UMP, euh, pour faire un grand parti euh, à droite. Mais Durant euh, le, le, le quinquennat qui suit, il ne donne aucun signe euh, d'ouverture vers tous ces électeurs qui se sont mobilisés pour faire front face au Front National. So, uh, immediately after the election, he nominated a right-wing prime minister. He uh, brought together elements of the right and the center to form a vast right-wing party, the UMP. Uh, and uh, I can't read my final notes. Uh, and he didn't give any sign of overture to uh, all the voters who cast, uh, cast a ballot for him, but were not right-wing supporters. Et le deuxième euh, événement fondateur, c'est euh, euh, le vote en France contre le traité constitutionnel européen en 2005. Euh, c'est un nom assez large. Et qu'est-ce qui va se passer euh, Deux ans plus tard, Nicolas Sarkozy euh, fait semblant de renégocier un nouveau traité qui sera euh, euh, copie conforme. Ok, so, uh, then in 2005, there was the uh, uh, national re referendum on the uh, revision of the constitutional treaty, uh, defining the obligations of the EU member states. Uh, 
uh, France uh, voted no. Uh, two years later, Sarkozy uh, uh, pretended to renegotiate this treaty and then uh, put it before the parliament, but nothing had really changed. Donc aujourd'hui, l'éclatement du Front républicain, il se construit sur ces deux frustrations de l'électorat. C'est-à-dire qu'on entend beaucoup dans l'électorat de gauche, et notamment les gens qui ont voté Jean-Luc Mélenchon, euh, on ne se fera plus avoir cette fois-ci. Le deuxième élément, donc le premier élément historique, le deuxième élément peut-être plus idéologique, c'est qu'il faut bien prendre conscience que en France, mais ce n'est pas uniquement euh, une, euh, un, un phénomène français, c'est que le sentiment anti-européen, le sentiment euh, anti-mondialiste, le sentiment anti-capitaliste, euh, avec la crise financière, a pris énormément d'essor en France. Et c'est ça aussi qui fait qu'aujourd'hui, euh, le paysage politique est, 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 est moins binaire qu'en 2002, euh, où il fallait euh, absolument résister à Marine Le Pen dans un, un fonds républicain. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, il y a un autre fonds qui s'est bâti, euh, et ça, ça c'est un petit peu les conséquences de la crise financière, de dire qu'il y a aussi un front euh, anticapitaliste qu'il faut tenir. Et ça aussi, c'est un argument qu'on retrouve souvent euh, dans la bouche des électeurs de gauche. Uh, so the second element is more ideological, and it's not just French, it extends beyond the boundaries of France. There has been a reaction against Europe, against globalization, uh, a, a reaction against the financial crisis, and this has resulted in the creation of a, an anti-capitalist front, uh, uh, which uh, has changed the French political landscape. <coughs> okay, now speaking for myself, I'm trying not to repeat uh, the points of my <coughs> predecessors, with which I, I agree, of course. Uh, I would uh, emphasize two things that have changed since 2002. Uh, one has to do with the nature of the Front National. Cécile uh, emphasized the change in rhetorical emphasis on the part of the candidate, but she's also changed the party in a deeper sense, bringing in new cadre around her. Uh, you've probably heard of Florian Philippot, uh, her number two, who is constantly on the airwaves. He's an Enoch. Uh, he is uh, originally uh, from the left. He claims to have been a follower of Jean-Pierre Chevènement, although many Chevènementistes uh, of the time say they never saw him at any meetings. <laughs> but anyway, he, he claims this past uh, of the left. Uh, but he's not the only one. Marine Le Pen has brought in uh, a number of other advisors. I was in Paris last January and interviewed one of them, a man named Sébastien Chedu, who was in charge of culture for the party. Uh, he uh, was a member of the UMP uh, and was uh, enjoying a brilliant career. In fact, he was chief of staff for Christine Lagarde when she was trade minister before becoming uh, minister of finance and then moving on to the IMF. So this was someone who was on the rise in the respectable right and yet he uh, transferred to the extreme right. So I put to him the question, what would make you join a pariah party? Uh, you were enjoying a successful career, there must be more to it than sheer opportunism. He said, uh, I, he's uh, gay, openly gay, uh, uh, heads a gay organization. He said he felt increasingly uncomfortable in the UMP uh, as it turned toward uh, more anti-gay politics, uh, partly in reaction to the passage of the same-sex marriage law under uh, Hollande. Uh, so, uh, He is not atypical of the new people that uh, Marine Le Pen has brought in uh, to the movement, and they have to some extent changed the message. Uh, uh, Cecile mentioned the dropping of uh, anti-Semitic themes and so on, but they've also reoriented the direction of the party to be uh, more anti-capitalist, more defense of the workers, uh, of the welfare state, but it's a welfare chauvinist state. That is, we keep up good welfare benefits, but only for the native born. Uh, not for immigrants. Uh, uh, the second way in which they've changed the rhetoric of the party is to uh, present it as the uh, staunchest defender of the values of the republic. Uh, a 
key value of the Republic is laicite, uh, secularism, uh, about which there is a great dispute about, about what it actually means. Its meaning has changed considerably since 1905. Uh, when church and state were officially separated, but it would take too long to go into all the details. Uh, the point to uh, retain here is that uh, uh, laicite has become a code word for anti-Islam. So Marine Le Pen has dropped the uh, anti-Semitic uh, aspects of the party, but has uh, turned the party in an anti-Islamic direction. And she says that Islam is inherently incompatible with the Republican value of laicite because uh, Muslims do not want to separate church and state. Uh, 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 finally, uh, to conclude briefly, uh, I want to point out that the party, the reason that the uh, good showing of the Front National uh, this time was not uh, a surprise as it was in 2002, was not only because the polls suggested that this was going to happen, but also because the Front National has been make, making steady progress since Marine Le Pen took over. It has improved its score in each successive election at different levels of government, departmental, regional, and so on. Uh, and it has taken control of a number of cities, uh, sometimes unsuccessfully, but in other cases, it has done a reasonably decent job of managing the city. So the notion that this outsider party uh, was so inexperienced with government, it would be a disaster if it came to power. That has been to some extent laid to rest by previous electoral successes. Thank you very much. Um, before um, <clears throat> trying to understand what's uh, going to happen next, and I have one more question about the uh, about the first round. Uh, as uh, many of you know, there were four uh, candidates uh, in, uh, in, in which made between 19 and 23 percent. So. Uh, uh, Mélenchon was at about 19%, Fillon uh, received 20% of the vote, Le Pen 21.5, and uh, Macron 23.5, And uh, so uh, I'd, like, I'd like you to comment on those results, if there is like one uh, uh, candidate whose score uh, should be, uh, you think should be uh, uh, analyzed a little further, I think we should, it would be great to speak a little about Mélenchon and Fillon and, and try to understand what happened to them before speaking about what's going to happen in the second round. But also, I wanted, I wanted to know if uh, you think that this, uh, this, this, this square configuration with like four front runners who are about the same size of the electorate indicates a transformation in the ideological landscape of France. Um, historians have been speaking about the, the deux France, the two Frances since uh, the Dreyfus affair. We have now four Frances that they're, you know, it's, it's difficult to reconciliate uh, some of the problems. So can you comment on this and maybe also, also say a little about both the success, the incredibly uh, uh, surprising success in the way of Mélenchon, who made uh, 92, received more than 19% when he was uh, at 11% at the last uh, elections, and also what happened to Fillon. So I don't know if we want to get, keep the same order or change, or... Uh, go ahead. Uh, oh, I, okay, we go in reverse. Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, that the uh, electoral landscape has been changed to some extent. Uh, one point to note is that this is the first time that the two mainstream parties have had primaries. The socialists have experimented with primaries before, but uh, not the, uh, 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 the uh, Republicans, formerly the UIP. Uh, and the result of this year was to uh, nominate two candidates who were probably not the best placed in their parties uh, to compete in the general election. The parties went to their uh, extremes, in a sense. Uh, Fillon, uh, Juppé, Sarkozy, they had uh, three programs that uh, uh, you could, uh, all of their planks were more or less identical, but the numbers were slightly different. Fillon wanted to cut the most uh, civil servants from the government, for example. Sarkozy, about half that number, Juppé, a little bit less than Sarkozy, and so on down the line. So uh, the voters went for the most extreme uh, 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 of the right wing candidates. The second point is that uh, Fillon, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, had the support of the most socially conservative element in the uh, right wing party. The people who were most upset by the same sex marriage law, for example, who marched in the Manif pour tous to protest that law, who were mostly uh, uh, practicing Catholics, although the number of practicing Catholics in France is, is rather small still in, uh, in this core of 
four million people, this hardcore of the right wing party, they turned out in much larger numbers than other segments of the party. So if you pay, who was the best place, according to the polls, to compete in the general election, was eliminated because of this heavy turnout of the more conservative elements of the party. Uh, I'll make one more point about the left, far left side of the spectrum, uh, Mélenchon. I think the Mélenchon re results are somewhat uh, misleading. Uh, right after the socialist primary, Mélenchon and Amon were at the same level. A lot of people on the left felt uh, they did not want to vote for Macron because he represented, uh, in their eyes, uh, neoliberalism, a word that I hate to use because it blurs all distinctions. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's a convenient shorthand in this case. Many people on the left felt uh, allergic to that. They felt that he represented the forces of globalization against which the left uh, should be pr protesting. Uh, but as long as those two candidates were roughly equal, uh, uh, there was no strategic reason to vote for one or the other. Then the first debate happened. Uh, the sequence here is quite interesting because on the eve of the first debate, Amon gave a speech. He had a very large meeting. He gave a speech which I thought was one of the best political speeches I've ever heard. Uh, it was uh, extremely good, and I thought this was going to liberate his candidacy. The next day, the first televised debate, the one that included only five uh, candidates, took place, and uh, Amon was widely perceived as having done the worst. He didn't fare well in that debate. And Mélenchon, who is particularly good in this format, did extremely well. Immediately after that, the polls started to shift. And when that happened, that gave a reason for voters on the left to say, if we want to have a left-wing candidate to counter Macron in the second round, the only chance is to go with Mélenchon. So I think you saw this hydraulic shift where voters started to drain away from uh, Amont and to start to increase the uh, uh, total of Mélenchon. And that had a self-reinforcing effect. So I don't think the message to take away is that Mélenchon uh, is the new face of the left in France, or that left-wing voters in France have turned to the, uh, the farthest extreme on the left. I don't think that's what happened. I think voters were voting strategically. There is, uh, admittedly, a hard core of Mélenchon voters, uh, but I don't think they represent 19% of the left. Je crois que pour comprendre les raisons de l'émergence de ce jeu à 4 avec des, des, des candidats autour de, de 20%, il faut donner quelques chiffres. Uh, in order to understand this four-way game that has emerged, uh, we have to look at a few figures. Il faut prendre conscience que uh, si on prend les deux parties de gouvernement qui ont été uh, quasi sans discontinuer uh, au deuxième tour de l'élection présidentielle, mis à part 2002, c'est-à-dire le Parti Socialiste d'un côté et les Républicains de l'autre, en 2007, ces deux partis faisaient 57% des voix. En 2012, 56%, donc ça n'avait pas trop bougé. Et en 2017, ça n'est plus que 26%. Donc il y a un effondrement total de ces deux partis de gouvernement. OK, so the two parties of government that have ruled France since 2002, the Socialists and the UNP or Republicans, uh, in 2007, uh, made 57% uh, of the electorate uh, between them. Uh, in 2012, it was 56%, uh, and this year it was only 26. So there's been a complete collapse of the mainstream parties. L'autre euh, élément intéressant, euh, qui était un petit peu occulté par le bon score de Jean-Luc Mélenchon, c'est euh, l'effondrement de, de, de la gauche en France. Euh, C'est le plus bas score que la gauche a réalisé au cours de la Ve République. Si on prend Mélenchon plus Hamon, donc le candidat du Parti Socialiste, euh, plus les deux trotskistes euh, Poutou et Artaud, on arrive à un score de 27%. Euh, il faut se souvenir qu'en 1969, lorsque Gaston Defer euh, n'avait fait que 5% des voix, qui était le, le candidat euh, de la SFIO, donc du Parti Socialiste, euh, on était au-dessus des 30%. Donc euh, c'est vraiment historique cet effondrement de la gauche. OK, so there's been a historic collapse of the left in France uh, on top of this general collapse of the two governing parties. Uh, if you add up the scores of uh, all the candidates of the left, the Socialist, Mélenchon, the two Trotskyists, uh, Poutou and Marteau, 
uh, they uh, together accounted for only 27% of the electorate. Uh, compare that to the score that Gus the Fair made in uh, uh, 69. Yeah. Uh, in 69, uh, when he uh, uh, represented the SFIO, the Socialist Party of that time, uh, scored only 6.5%. The left-wing candidates together scored 30%. That would include the Communist Party. The dernier élément en trompe l'œil, c'est le score de François Fillon, donc de la, la droite euh, républicaine. Euh, il faut bien prendre conscience que les électeurs de droite ne se sont pas euh, évanouis dans la nature et qu'il ne reste plus que 20% euh, de l'électorat qui vote à droite aujourd'hui. Mais euh, bien évidemment, euh, l'impact des, des, des affaires euh, qui lui ont collé la, la, la peau euh, pendant. Euh, tout, 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 toute la campagne euh, fait qu'aujourd'hui il en est euh, revenu à un, à un socle incompressible de, de, de 20% mais je pense qu'au euh, moment des législatives on va voir un, un parti républicain euh, euh, bien au-delà de, 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 de ces 20% donc ce jeu à 4 euh, là aussi il faut, faut un petit peu re relativiser les choses uh, Ok, donc so, uh, Fillon's score de 19% est un peu misleading uh... The right-wing voters have not just disappeared, uh, they were driven away from Fillon's candidacy by the series of scandals that uh, continue to be revealed over the course of the campaign, uh, and that accounts for uh, his low score, which represents a, a kind of in incompressible base of the right, uh, but uh, the right is going to come surging back in the legislative election. Yes, so um, I'd like to, to go to the last part of the question, which was how do we understand how to situate the four major players that we have arrived at um, for this first round? Um, it, it's becoming extremely confusing. If you've heard uh, the campaign, uh, all of the major candidates have said they are outside of the system that even Fillon is the rebel of the system. If you've seen a picture of him, you will wonder if that worked for him. Um, they're all so out of the system, against the system, Macron included. Um, and on top of that, you have uh, two populist candidates, Jean-Marie Le Pen, Jean-Luc Mélenchon and Marie Le Pen. Um, and I'm going to, to, to develop why it matters. Uh, they're both um, against uh, the, Europe, the European Union as it stands and have an extremely violent vocabulary against it. They have been extremely violent against the media and they have invoked both the people, this abstract archetypal notion, um, to um, discredit uh, the elite and I'm putting all of these words in quotation marks. But you also have other um, affinities um, within those four major players. Um, for instance, um, when you ask people why, what are the main stakes that they consider when they vote, National Front voters say first immigration. 69% of National Front voters say immigration is the top priority for us when I go vote for Marine Le Pen. No other party has such a high number for immigration as a top priority. But Fillon voters too rank immigration as the second most important issue just after unemployment. Uh, National Front voters also state terrorism as a major stake for the election. And Fillon voters as well. It's the third most important stake for Fillon voters. The difference is that uh, people who vote Fillon are also extremely concerned about the debt um, and economic <coughs> consequences of the debt for France's uh, economic growth. And National Front voters don't, don't care at all about debt, uh, the debt crisis in France. Only 5% of them think it's an important thing. So what I'm trying to say here is that you have, for all of these candidates' affinities and differences, and one way to represent it is not on a continuum from far right to far left, actually, but as um, a square, a logical square that you can find in, in philosophy or linguistics. Um, and you would have on one axis um, 
positions on the economy, and on the other, positions on cultural issues, and among these I would include immigration, uh, gay rights and minority rights in general, what a political scientist in general call the difference between <coughs> ethnocentrist positions and um, liberal, I guess would be the right word in English, positions on cultural and social issues. And so the um, differences are you open to um, for the economy, market economy, and as a consequence also the European Union, which favors market economy across Europe and globalization in general, or are you against it? This is the economic axis. And the cultural axis, are you against or in favor of an open society that welcomes immigrants, minorities, gays, favors equality among men and women, and so on and so forth. And if you build this square, um, you would have one candidate who is opposed both to globalization and market economy in general, and on the global level, and also to um, an open society which favors uh, or, or protects minorities, is Marine Le Pen. And you also have one candidate who is universally uh, liberal in the American and French sense, who favors market economy, the European Union, globalization, and an open society in terms of, of cultural values, and that's Emmanuel Macron. And they are the exact antithesis one from the other. But then you have Fillon who is against immigration, very strongly against immigration, and very strongly against uh, minority rights, including gay rights, and very conservative and cultural issues, but open to the European Union and to market economy and to globalization. So it would be on the other corner. And Fillon, oh, sorry, Mélenchon, is open to minority rights, social issues, cultural issues, but opposed to market economy, the European Union, and globalization. So you see why you can divide this square along different axes and see how Marine Le Pen wants to address Mélenchon voters saying we have a common enemy. Hypercapitalism is how she calls it, the European Union as it stands, um, money, the uh, puissance d'argent, um, and since they have used the same rhetoric about invoking the people as the legitimate source of sovereignty and legitimacy, they share already a rhetoric to attack this, uh, this enemy. But on the other side, uh, she can also talk to female voters and actually the widest um, overlap between electorates right now is between Fillon and Marie Le Pen voters. Uh, election after election, between 20 and 30 percent of the Republican Party, if they have the chance to choose between a National Front or a left candidate, go to the National Front. Because they are exactly um, similar on immigration and for the most part on social um, societal issues and cultural issues. So that's, so here if you think of it is that we, you, we're used to thinking in, in terms of left and, and right, in terms of this continuum uh, on one axis. And actually within both big government parties, the UMP slash Republican and the Socialist Party, this fractures were starting to appear specifically around globalization, market economy, how far you go, or, or, or the place of the welfare state. But now it's out in the open. And, and with someone like Amun um, disappearing from the radar, it's very clear that the fault lines are not anymore for or against welfare state, actually. But this combination of two axes, cultural and economical, and it's really important to remember that National Front voters are in their huge majority motivated by immigration and security as an issue, and third only, unemployment. So even though Marine Le Pen has developed a social cord to her um, argumentation, people who care the most about um, uh, social inequalities or unemployment or even purchasing power do not go vote national for national. Okay.
it's, it's when you really believe the immigration is a big issue that you build national fund, not when you think the biggest problem for France is the economy. Thank you. So now we are um, facing the uh, difficult issue of squaring the square or reducing the square to a two, uh, to a, a tennis court with, with two opponents. Um, so um, could you maybe go um, a little deeper into the programs of both candidates and explain to us exactly what is at stake uh, on Sunday? Is this uh, just you know Europe versus non-Europe versus versus national sovereignty? the welfare state versus the dismantlement of the last remnant of the French welfare state, as some people have, uh, have said, the market versus the state, the, um, in terms of the electorate, the, the educated urban elite, which has benefited from Europe, versus the uh, less educated, more rural uh, uh, part of the population that has not been able to maybe enjoy the benefits of uh, globalization and of the uh, strengthening of Europe as much as the uh, urban elite. Uh, is this neoliberalism versus fascism, as uh, some people would say? What, what's, can, you, can we try to understand uh, maybe beyond those dichotomies, that, you know, kind of the easy dichotomies that you find in the French press today, and the invectives and the very strong you know, uh, exchanges on uh, Facebook? <laughs> yeah private dinners, people are, are fighting quite a lot uh, about those, those terms. Can, we, can you complexify a little uh, what is uh, at stake? So maybe you should start with this uh, in the middle. Alors. Le problème, c'est que les choses se sont énormément complexifiées depuis euh, 48 heures, depuis le, le ralliement de Nicolas Dupont-Aignan, qui se situait euh, dans le paysage politique entre euh, le Front National euh, et euh, la droite républicaine, l'UMP. Uh, so things have become much more complicated over the last 48 hours since uh, Nicolas Dupont-Aignan, the candidate of uh, de Boula France. Uh, which situ was situated between uh, the FN and the Republicans, uh, has rallied to uh, Marine Le Pen, and that has changed the complexion. Ce n'est pas tant par le poids euh, qu'il représente, parce qu'il a fait 4,7%, je, je crois, des, des voix au premier tour, mais c'est surtout qu'il il opère un, un, un changement euh, radical dans le programme de Marine Le Pen, dont euh, la plateforme, maintenant, ne fait plus. Euh, de la sortie de l'euro un, un préalable, ce qui était jusqu'à présent le, le pilier de, de son programme. Ok, so uh, the uh, presence of uh, du Montagnon uh, at the side of Marine Le Pen has changed things a lot, not because of the weight of his votes, he scored only 4.7% in the second round, uh, but because of his uh, ideological positioning, so that Uh, leaving the euro and leaving the European Union, which had been centerpieces of Marine Le Pen's platform, have now been set aside. Uh, and I will editorialize here almost uh, <laughs> shockingly without uh, uh, any, any explanation. Any explanation. Any explanation. <laughs> uh, and it's a funny thing. Basically, we said that I, I was uh, never in favor of the single currency, but I've always been in favor of a common currency, whatever that means. Uh, so this happened overnight, and suddenly she's a different candidate, or pretending to be a different candidate. Donc, ça, ça pose des questions stratégiques parce que Marine Le Pen a très bien compris que la sortie de l'euro était un, un repoussoir pour une majorité de Français. 70% des Français sont contre une sortie de l'euro. Uh, right, so uh, 70% of, uh, of the French who were against uh, leaving the euro, uh, and that uh, created a barrier for the uh, Le Pen vote, and probably put a ceiling on that vote. But now that that uh, ceiling has been punctured by this uh, ideological shift, uh, we don't know if it uh, will still prevent people from voting. Et ce, ce que l'on a euh, du, du mal à comprendre maintenant, c'est euh, en termes d'application de, de, euh, de son programme, parce que une bonne partie euh, de son explication euh, du financement euh, des mesures qu'elle voulait prendre, comme euh, le euh, retour à une retraite à 60 ans, euh, à des mesures tr très sociales, tout le financement tenait autour euh, d'une sortie de l'euro, euh, et on allait se défaire de ce carcan européen, et pour reprendre des marges de manœuvre qui permettraient de financer son programme économique. 
Uh, in Le Pen's rhetoric up until uh, two days ago, uh, the explanation of how she was going to finance all the things that she wanted to do uh, to perpetuate the welfare state, such as uh, maintaining retirement age at 60 years and uh, uh, other benefits dependent on uh, the boom that she claimed she was going to get from leaving the European Union, uh, which was imposing uh, restrictions and limits on uh, uh, French national sovereignty in the uh, uh, matter, the fiscal matters, budget deficits, and so on. Uh, now that that seems to have been set aside, uh, there is no explanation of how she's going to pay for uh, what uh, still remains part of the program. Donc, maintenant, c'est très difficile d'anticiper euh, de, de, de quelle façon ce, 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 ce virage de 180 degrés euh, va pénétrer l'électorat. Est-ce que les gens euh, euh, vont rester sur euh, leur première impression de, de parti anti-européen euh, ou bien va-t-elle réussir à, à ramener une partie des électeurs de droite Parce que ça, c'était vraiment un, 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 un point euh, très important euh, pour l'électorat de droite de ne pas voter Marine Le Pen, c'était la sortie de l'euro. Donc la question est de savoir c'est si euh, cette, ce, ce changement euh, radical très tardif va permettre d'attirer une, une partie de l'électorat de droite. Okay, so now that this 180 degree turn in uh, Le Pen's positioning has taken place, the question is how are voters going to interpret this change? Will they still perceive the Front National as a party that is basically anti-European, anti-EU, uh, and credit that as uh, uh, the, the basis of the program, or are they going to see uh, uh, a change toward a more traditional right-wing party? Uh, which they might uh, find it more acceptable to vote for. Will that bring in uh, a large swath of right-wing voters who had previously uh, resisted this change because they uh, thought that uh, leaving the European Union would be too radical? Uh, rapidement sur le, le programme d'Emmanuel Macron, uh, cette, cette difficulté uh, pour le deuxième tour, ça va être d'envoyer uh, des, des messages par rapport à l'électorat qui a voté Jean-Luc Mélenchon au premier tour. Et là, le repoussoir pour les gens qui ont voté Mélenchon, c'est pas l'euro, mais c'est plutôt la loi sur le travail que Emmanuel Macron a porté durant le gouvernement sous François Hollande. Et là, il a promis de faire une nouvelle version euh, votée par ordonnance. Donc ça, c'est un vrai repoussoir. So the question for Macron is uh, just how attractive he can be to Mélenchon voters who are particularly resistant to uh, the reform of the labor code, uh, some steps toward which were taken under Hollande with uh, input from Macron. And now Macron wants to go even farther Uh, what's more, he said that he will uh, affect these further changes in the labor code reform by de decree, by executive order, uh, uh, rather than through the normal legislative process. And this uh, is shocking to the sensibilities of the left, which are particularly upset by the uh, proposed labor uh, provisions. Yes, your, your comments made me think about what's going to happen, actually. Um, <laughs> One way to summarize what has just been said is that Marine Le Pen is having a very good second round campaign, a super smart one, and she's able to tap into potential niche in the Republican Party, specifically now that she has given away the anti-European Union or anti-Euro rhetoric, and at the same time um, try to appeal to Uh, voters of Mélenchon. If we want to look at the other side, I think you've explained it um, fantastically, and look at Macron, um, the difficulty is that now it seems that the, um, the second round is played on the ideological level, purely and simply. The differences in policies, um, are significant, but they're not emphasized that much for several reasons. For Marine Le Pen, because she has an argument as to how she's going to finance her platform, which has just changed in the past 48 hours. And Emmanuel Macron, 
cannot emphasize too much um, the measures he has to, as he calls it, simplify or fluidify even the economy because it would be uh, a repulsive, uh, repulsive is a strong word in English, but it would be um, a deterrent for people from the left who have been opposed uh, to the um, labor law reform in the last two years. And uh, the problem is Emmanuel Macron, ideologically speaking, is extremely flimsy. Um, Marine Le Pen is a great ideologue. She's consistent. She offers a simple, legible, understandable narrative of why we're here now, what are the problems of the world, and what are the solutions. She has a narrative about France's past and present, and she can um, rally her supporters about values. And people vote for values and determine that sound for values in the in the big parts. National identity, civilization, culture, even laicity, which is has taken as a way to defend women against Islam. My uh, pardon, Ibn Macron has been all over the map on the biological spectrum and been studying his discourses as well. And he is able to, on the one hand, also sing the eternal France a phrase I had seen only in Jean-Marie Le Pen and Marie Le Pen before, uh, have this bucolic image of an ideal France with its landscapes and rivers and, and kings and heroes, um, and at the same time say, France has no French culture. And it's extremely easy to uh, tear apart Emmanuel Macron's ideology, because he has professed to have none, but be a pragmatist. His advantage is not ideas or values as much as energy, enthusiasm, <coughs> optimism. It's the register of the speech and the, 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 the capability to mobilize and galvanize people by speaking to them and letting them do things uh, and become militants of his own movement, that he's been able to, to do politics differently. But now he's in front of someone who's extremely structured, ideologically speaking. And in front of her, in front of her he's run rather as a, as a disadvantage, actually. Um, so, and I guess this is how I would conclude, is that um, we can use all the dichotomies that um, you know, come election day, um, you don't need just to share values with the candidate. You also have to get the motivation to actually go out and vote on a three-day weekend, which might be sunny uh, next week. So everything is going to rely on abstention and turnout and differential turnout. So. Uh, okay, in, in order to leave some time for the questions from the audience, I'll try to be brief uh, and make just two points. The first is I'm going to be more optimistic than both of my panel mates who <coughs> flatly predict that Macron is going to win this election. Uh, the polls uh, have hardly wavered at all since the first round. They've uh, been uh, at the level of uh, 60 to 40. Uh, Nate Silver, who had it, our American polling expert, who had expressed uh, some skepticism about the first round of polls because there was so little variation, uh, was proved wrong. The, the first round polls were exactly on the money. Uh, and I think the second round polls are going to prove to be on the money too. That said, uh, I think there's a deep paradox about Macron's victory. Uh, we are in this predicament in France because there have been two successive failed presidencies. Socrates and Hollande. Hollande plummeted to 4% in approval rating, which is unheard of. If you know anything about statistics, you know that sampling error should put people above 4%, even if you have zero uh, uh, And the reason Hollande, there were many reasons Hollande was so unpopular, uh, but one of them was uh, the reform that bears uh, Macron's name, the Hollande Macron. And then the well, El Comri, which bears another minister's name, but which was largely influenced by Macron. 
So why did he emerge from this wreckage of the Hollande presidency as such a popular candidate? Well, for one thing, uh, there's another aspect of Hollande's unpopularity, and that's that he ran as something that he was not. He said famously at Le Bourget, my only enemy is the world of finance. But we now know from the interviews that he approvedly gave to a number of journalists that for years he had been writing books under pseudonym in which he said he was precisely in favor of the kinds of reforms of the labor laws and so on that Macron uh, implemented. And I think uh, the voters recognize the fact that Macron uh, is the genuine article. He's not pretending to be anything other than what he is. He is a, a reformer in favor of uh, liberalizing market reforms, uh, uh, market regulations, uh, uh, moving toward a Scandinavian flex security model. Uh, they may not believe that these reforms will be successful. I, I think myself that they're uh, going to prove uh, inadequate to bring about the changes that he wants, but. Uh, I think there has been a yearning uh, for some years now for a realignment of the French political landscape in the center. There's been, and that's what Macron recognized. There's one element of genius in Macron. He's not a politician I particularly warm to, but I have to give him credit for recognizing that Hollande's failure was going to uh, uh, disable the left and open up a space where someone could run to the left of Alain Chimpey and have a shot at winning the presidency. That was his uh, uh, insight of genius, and it's the reason he's going to be the next president of France. Thank you very much. Before, uh, before opening the room for some, some questions, I had a, I'd like to, to finish with a, a short round on the uh, post May 7th. So first of all, even if, um, sorry, just uh, two questions in one about what will happen after May 7th. Number one, um, do numbers matter? Would that make a difference if Macron wins? Uh, you said Macron will win, and it seems to be that way. Although we uh, know that sometimes it goes the other way. Uh, but uh, if he wins with 70% uh, versus 60% versus you know 52%, uh, what would be you know what 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 would, what, the, what would the difference be? Thomas Piketty called uh, two days ago for uh, everybody to vote for Macron produce some kind of Chirac effect of 2002, like to show that actually uh, this is not his program, but that is a um, uh, plebiscite, but that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an anti Le Pen uh, movement, an anti-fascist front. Uh, so could, could, could you say something about this? And also, what will happen after the 7th? So in June, there are legislative elections in France. The only thing we know is that the, 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 the next president is uh, going to be without a obvious uh, majority. Uh, Le Pen, the, the National Front right now has two deputies officially in the parliament. Obviously, there is no Macron. Uh, I mean, there are people who are in favor of Macron who are uh, currently deputies, both in the center right and the Socialist Party, but there is no uh, clear um, uh, you know, program to, 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 to have a, a party of government behind the president. So can you say, uh, can you answer those two questions before we open the, the room so maybe we can go back to that side? Yes. Uh, so will it matter if uh, Macron wins with 70% uh, or 45%? Of course, everybody agrees that it will matter if Marine Le Pen is elected instead of Macron. Mm -hmm. uh, but if she if she improves her score to uh, to a great extent, like if she goes to 45, then she will have assured legitimacy within her own party for the next five years. She will be um, she will have the momentum for the legislative elections, and momentum is everything uh, in elections. <laughs> and there will be. Also, consequences for Mélenchon's uh, movement, which is not a party, because it is expected that some of the blame will fall on his shoulders for not having been clear and calling to vote nominally for Macron rather than just against Le Pen. Um, so there, there's going to be a lot of consequences. I want to just. Uh, We've been talking about numbers and candidates, but there are real life effects of this vote for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people who do not vote because they are uh, foreigners in France. 
Um, I'm sure you have examples of your own, but in California, the states that voted for Hillary Clinton, I think 65% you know, of voters voted for Hillary Clinton. The minute Trump was elected, outright racism against children from mixed race marriages, against immigrants, and then against um, um, you know, gays and lesbians on campuses, even on campuses, um, it's just spread out. So uh, I can't think what are the going to be the consequences in France, but if she loses with 45% of the votes, again, it legitimizes what the National Fund discourse stands for. And I guess it was obvious, but we've not stated that the National Fund discourse for all of its changes, rhetorical and uh, in terms of platform, continues to have at its core uh, the rejection of anyone who is not born French with French blood um, in its you know, uh, genealogical tree. Sur, sur la première question, je pense qu'il y a un, un enjeu externe de réputation, c'est-à-dire que si on est plus proche de 60-40 que de 52-48, ça donne une autre image de la France, ici aux États-Unis, en Grande-Bretagne, et, et c'est un autre message qu'on envoie à, à travers le monde. Okay, so there's an issue of France's image abroad, uh, and it will make a big difference uh, uh, in defining that image, uh, depending on what the vote totals are. Maintenant, euh, peut-être qu'un petit score ne serait pas si désavantageux à Emmanuel Macron, euh, parce que justement, il ne se retrouverait pas dans la situation de Jacques Chirac. Euh, là, comme ça serait la deuxième fois qu'il y aurait ce scénario, il serait obligé de donner euh, des gages à tous ces gens qui se seraient mobilisés pour lui. Et s'il est à, à 54-55%, il peut dire « Vous n'avez pas voulu voter pour moi, euh, je continue ma route, j'ai une plateforme électorale et je l'appliquerai euh, sans faillir. » So, uh, a low score is not necessarily a disadvantage for Macron. He's not going to be in the same situation as Chirac. Uh, if he uh, scores around 54 or 55 and wins with that total, then uh, he'll say, I'm going to continue with my program. Uh, this is what I ran on. I was elected, but uh, uh, this is where things stand, and now I need to support my reform. Le, le scénario des, des législatives, euh, on, on fait tout de suite, euh, est, est très compliqué à, à, à deviner, mais si, si jamais il y a une dynamique ma Macron, euh, même s'il n'a pas, euh, comme ça a été toujours le cas euh, dans la Ve République, à savoir que le président a dans la foulée une majorité au Parlement, euh, même si ça n'est pas le cas, euh, on peut assister à une nouvelle configuration de, de, des institutions de la Ve République, à savoir euh, qu'il serait capable euh, de réunir autour de lui une coalition euh, qui ne serait pas tout à fait une majorité présidentielle, mais euh, qui serait capable de faire des, des choses ensemble. Et, et moi, je, je pense que c'est le scénario qui se confirme. Uh, so, uh, the, the parties may not put, put together a, a presidential majority, but uh, uh, they will be able to put together a group uh, that uh, will define what can be done together going forward uh, in this newly defined uh, like in Germany. Uh, like in Germany. So, so uh, I'm glad you brought up Germany because I think that's one possibility that what you'll see is a, a grand coalition emerging in the center between uh, going from the Walsist uh, on the socialist side to the Juppéist on the right side. They will coalesce around uh, Macron. Uh, Macron has very good relations with uh, German leaders. I think that's one of his big advantages coming into this election. Uh, Germany uh, recognizes that the current situation in Europe cannot continue. Uh, the Germans are rigid, but they're not stupid. Uh, they recognize that uh, the, their insistence on uh, austerity has provoked this populist reaction across Europe, and they know that they need to do something about it. They also uh, can read statistics, and they know that uh, uh, current account deficit, trade deficit, uh, trade surplus rather, current account surplus 
of 9%, 10% of GDP is unsustainable. Uh, they've begun to do something about that uh, uh, in allowing unit labor costs to rise. And they ha all of the prominent German leaders have endorsed Macron, uh, both on the SPD side and on the Christian Democrat wow, side. Wow, that's not true, but Macron well, got some support. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a nominal support, but, uh, Mark, Mark, but Martin Schultz uh, actually has very good relations with Macron yeah. and uh, indicated that he would work with uh, Macron. So uh, uh, my belief is that uh, the Germans are waiting for the election of Macron as a symbol that France can be trusted. They have not trusted uh, previous French leaders, especially not Hollande. Uh, uh, and uh, they believe they can trust Macron and are will, will be willing to make more concessions. So this is very significant. Uh, as far as the legislative elections themselves go, I think it's a total mess, particularly on the socialist side. The Socialist Party is in a shambles and it uh, will not fare well, in my opinion, legislative election. It's going to be uh, uh, trying to rebuild itself internally. There will be a lot of infighting about who gets what uh, in investitures, and uh, it, it's going to be terrible. On the right side, the uh, Republicans see this as their opportunity to uh, uh, reinvent. They feel this election was stolen from them, uh, and they're going to try to win it back by organizing uh, effectively for the legislative elections. Now, uh, there are rivalries of ambition on the Republican side, too, that may get in the way of that strategy, but I think they're going to be uh, able to overcome those rivalries sufficiently to make a strategic agreement about, uh, uh, and they hope that they will be in a strong enough position in the legislature to be able to impose their prime minister on Macron. Uh, Macron's choice of prime minister will be crucial. Uh, he may make it before the legislative elections, he may not. Uh, there are a lot of considerations that go into this. Whatever he comes out of this election with, it's going to be a very unstable coalition. He's not going to have his own people there. He's going to have to negotiate with people who are hostile to him in one respect or, or another and who don't agree with each other. Uh, so uh, he's uh, going to be uh, a president who has to be very careful or very artful or very lucky. And one thing you could say about him to this point is that he's been extraordinarily lucky. <laughs> of course, luck runs out at some point. <laughs> As a um, controversy musician teacher, I'm going to speak about Virtu and Fortuna in my career. Uh, to be expensive. So, um, thank you very much. We have covered a lot of terrain uh, in about an hour. And, and really thank you for the, for the uh, panelists for their extremely interesting insights. But I think it's going to get even more interesting with a question from the public, always challenging. So um, let's take that. Yes. Uh, can, you stand up and, yes. And can you stand up and speak in thank the Thank you very much. Um, I want to say it's not just hate speech, it's hate crimes. And these have been documented by some poverty law center very uh, actively. But I have two very three brief questions. One is uh, Le Pen's turn uh, in terms of some issues pro-Europe. Uh, she may gain some people on the right, but will she lose her base? Will they be threatened? So that's one question. The other question which, uh, is the fear question. But it works two ways. Fear of the Front National on the one hand, but none of you have mentioned misogyny. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because, of course, we know what happened in the, in the US election. And thirdly, could you address the issue of absenteeism, which I think is a really serious issue? Uh, well, uh, I, I, to, on the issue of misogyny, uh, I, I've given previous talks in this election, and the question has always come up, what, what about uh, feminism, what about female candidates in this election? The striking thing to me about uh, Marie Le Pen is that she's perceived uh, as uh, Representative of the Front National first, and as a woman far down the list, uh, she is her father's daughter, uh, and she's seen uh, she's a, a tough woman, but tough before woman. Uh, she has tried to position herself as the feminist candidate in the race, uh, as, as straight as that may seem. Uh, but I don't think that uh, that has had a, a great effect. Uh, if by absenteeism you mean abstention, yes. Yeah, it's a, a extraordinarily high level this year. Normally, uh, in terms of presidential elections, uh, 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 a 
abstention is, uh, is rather low. There's been a book written this year by the head of one of the major polling agencies, uh, which uh, has the title of uh, uh, nothing more to do with politics. Uh, a lot of people have just turned their backs on politics entirely. Anybody estimate how high that would be? Well, the abstention rate is going to be over 30%. It was 22 for the first round. There were uh, well, yeah, I, 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 there was speculation that it would be over 30 percent, but it was lower, so maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, actually, uh, only American and English journalists asked me about the gender card played by Marine Le Pen. Not a single French journalist has mentioned this issue to me uh, ever, actually. Um, and it's, it's surprising because in this election, Marine Le Pen has tried to play the gender card. She has posed as a mother. Uh, she mentioned that she's a maman in a lot of her interviews on national television, uh, which is a new thing for her. Um, and this is because now she wants to erase the fact that she's a daughter, uh, first and foremost, politically speaking. And so she's trying to shift the attention to the other side of the lineage, to her children. And, represent the future of the country. Um, but it is true that, and, and maybe um, Stefano can, can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the media has not paid attention to her being a woman, and in, in a way it goes against misogyny being a player here, because she is not criticized um, because of specifically female stereotypical attributes, you know, the way Sigurd and Bayan was in 2007. Actually, people are actually make her, but I think people are not even careful there. She's not considered a woman first, but more the leader of the National Front. And even though she's played the feminist card, it has been demystified by so many commentators and uh, political opponents that I think it, it resonates for voters when she raises the fear of uh, Islam being a misogynist religion. So misogyny plays around Islam and not around uh, Mahim um, And then for um, people not turning out next Sunday, uh, the worrying number that makes me less optimistic uh, than Arthur is that uh, right now in the polls at least, uh, people who voted for Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, Sundays ago, 40% of them say they will either abstain from voting or do what's called a, a white vote, which is you put nothing in the envelope. Spoiled spoil the ballot. Okay, thank you. 40% uh, of 20%, uh, this few percentage points that might raise uh, the numbers of Mahim and Men. Um, and also for Europe, I think actually that Europe, um, again, Marine Le Pen's only constituents are not so strongly attached of, of switching to the Franks. Uh, frankly, a lot of her supporters in the south of France are shopkeepers, small entrepreneurs. They don't want to have to change their books, actually. It's one of the arguments that make voting for her not as great as it could be if only her opposition to the Eurozone uh, was in, in the <coughs> platform. So it's not detrimental to her. Just continue, she's going to continue to to slam the European Union, even if she's not going to exit the Euro in another way. Bon, je, juste un mot sur la, la misogynie. Je, je confirme que ça n'a pas été un, un thème qui a été euh, relevé ni, ni par la presse euh, ni par l'opinion. Euh, D'ailleurs, ça aurait été compliqué parce que il n'y a pas grand chose dans le programme de Marine Le Pen qui porte sur les droits de la femme. Yeah, so he's uh, agreeing that misogyny has not been a major issue either for the press or for public opinion uh, because of very little in the Pen's platform of Paris. La seule note de misogynie, je ne sais pas si on peut appeler ça de la misogynie, mais moi ça m'a un petit peu choqué, c'est tout ce qui traînait sur les réseaux sociaux, sur la différence d'âge entre la femme d'Emmanuel de, Macron et... et, et là, là c'était vraiment la, la misogynie en tête pure, euh, I, I see a lot of heads nodding, maybe there's no need for translation. <laughs> anyway, he points out that the difference in age between Macron and his wife, who's 25 years older, has been uh, an issue in social media. Uh, I would add to that that the Russian propaganda lets him playing that up very heavily, uh, suggesting that Macron is uh, 
homosexual, uh, uh, hoping that that will stick. I must say that uh, there is a bonus for the Facebook followers of the Maison Française event because on April 17th, two weeks ago, we had a, uh, an event about gender in France and there were very interesting remarks being done by the um, by, by a political scientist on the fact that Marine Le Pen is the first queer candidate. She's yeah. neither a man or a woman. She's beyond the... Uh, she's, she's really beyond the... But that's serious. Don't, she's don't tell that to the French audience. Yeah. They, they will freak out yeah. entirely. Actually, yeah. maybe that's... Um, you know, even gender is not a word you can use. They freak out and all. But, but she's beyond uh, gender stereotypes. I just sort of like to add one word to what Stefan said about the Euro. Uh, I, I think it's, it's quite true that uh, Marine Le Pen has been looking for an out from her hard position on the Euro because uh, polls show that this has not been working for her. And I think her internal polls after the first round uh, show that this was going to lose her the election. Her only chance was to uh, give voters some reason to doubt she would not carry through on her threat to have an immediate referendum on Frexit. Uh, this was scaring people. Uh, so this is the strategy behind the alliance with uh, Dupont-Aignan and the backtracking on the Euro. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. It's too late. And there's a debate coming up, uh, one debate between the two rounds. Uh, if Macron has uh, any forensic ability at all, he should be able to demolish her on this new turn. Uh, this is something he's really good at. I mean, he's, he's educated in economics. So you should be able to uh, make mincemeat of her uh, On the other hand, he has a tendency to come across as arrogant, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Mitterrand won one debate against uh, Giscard by saying, je ne suis pas votre élève, monsieur. <laughs> Giscard this son. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so sometimes uh, being too much of an explainer uh, doesn't work. Uh, Ferdinand Wobberov, uh, student here. Uh, my question would be what comes after the election if Le Pen wins. Uh, how can he, she can go forward with her policy ideas? We have seen here that the president had some major issues. Uh, even he has a majority in the House and uh, the uh, Senate. So what can we expect there? Je pense qu'il y a très peu de chances que dans la foulée, Marine Le Pen ait une vraie majorité. I, I used, there's little chance after the election that uh, uh, Le Pen will have a majority. Les estimations lui donnent 80 à 100 députés maximum. 48 to 100 deputies maximum. 80 to 100 deputies Sur 477. Et le, le, le sujet, c'est de savoir si euh, le, le, le ralliement de Nicolas Dupont-Aignan va euh, donner euh, des idées euh, des élus républicains euh, isolés, des espèces de francs-tireurs euh, ici et là, qui se disent bah, « ça y est, on, on peut passer le Rubicon, il euh, euh, y en a un qui l'a déjà fait, et donc euh, on, on va jouer la, la carte marine de Ça, ça c'est une possibilité. » Donc la question est, est-ce que Dupont-Aignan's crossing the Rubicon going to uh, change the mindset of others on the right who have been uh, saying to themselves it's impossible to join Marine Le Pen uh, now in Someone has done it, maybe we can do it too. Also, she has promised to do a constitutional revision, which would be approved by referendum. So, her idea is to bypass the Congress to be able to apply some of her platform.
in a very divided country like France was not only a surprise, but um, semantically hard to understand. And he's been, um, I mean, throughout his campaign for a whole year, um, advancing this idea that he wants to reconcile the contraries, uh, reconcile people whom he calls progressives, I guess, uh, against uh, extremes. But you have to remember that the left-right divide um, is extremely ingrained, and even now that uh, the two uh, major political parties seem to have, you know, crumbled, this is the political offer was out there. But when you ask people, where do you situate yourself on a right to left spectrum, they all know where they are, and they know precisely. Um, so it's not true that because you have three at least anti-system candidates who are so high in the election that the left-right divide has fallen off. Um, but the difficulty for international press to keep on who he is is also because there's no lineage uh, to which to um, attach him and understand him with a comparison to reference points that Americans can understand. But my own personal conclusion from studying his discourse and François Hollande and others is that actually he is doing what François Hollande, he's promising to do what François Hollande did without explaining who was doing it. So Macron is the explicit, young, dynamic version of Hollande in terms of policy and even in terms of rhetoric. Uh, Macron has been known for saying all the time, and at the same time, uh, et en so he's going to say, for instance, uh, I want to liberalize uh, the job market and at the same time offer more protection, which is this kind of contradictory thing. Um, and when you look at François Hollande, he's actually doing exactly the same thing in his speeches as, as well. Um, it, it, it's uh, just one word. It, it's not an accident that you can't pinpoint him. This has been his strategy in the early stages of the campaign. There was a great deal of pressure on him to release detailed position papers. And he said at one point, programs don't matter. Programs don't matter. And in a sense, he's being true to the spirit of the uh, presidency of the Fifth Republic. Uh, the goal imagine this presidency as something that floats above the uh, uh, political parties uh, and that makes decisions about uh, grand uh, matters of principle. I think. Uh, uh, Macron sees himself in that role, but he also sees himself uh, as a deal maker, someone who has been a negotiator, worked in the private sector, knows how uh, negotiations work, uh, and you uh, don't tip your hand in negotiations. So uh, if you don't like that, then you can't vote Macron. That's, that's who he is. Yes, it is known that Macron uh, got his start in the Rothschild Bank, which is a very uh, indicative marker in contrast with his relationship as the Minister of Economy of the Socialist Party. How closely tied is he to the uh, big banking interests that have determined the, the, the fortunes of Europe and the world, uh, global banking and such? It seems that that is a more determinant marker of his what his policies may be than, than his record. Uh, Macron is strongly backed by the Institut Montaigne, which was founded by uh, uh, Claude Bébéard from the AXA Insurance uh, Company. On the other hand, Henri de Castries, who is now in charge of uh, the head of the board of directors of the Institut Montaigne. I was back in Fion, uh, and the Castri took over the uh, AXA from uh, BBR. So yes, he has ties to this world. Uh, he has a lot of backing from financial interest, uh, but I don't think that means he is uh, there. He's subservient to big capital, lieutenant of capital, as we used to say in uh, Marxist days. Uh, he uh, uh, has. Uh, carved out a, a unique career for himself, uh, moving back and forth from uh, government uh, service to private sector. 
undoubtedly he's absorbed some ideas that are congenial to bankers, but he's also absorbed some ideas that are not congenial to them. So I don't think it's fair to characterize himself as uh, characterize him as a banker. And I particularly don't like the fact that whenever his banking career is mentioned, the name Rothschild is linked to it as though he's uh, a representative of Jewish capitalism. Puis, François Fillon, c'est qu'il a toujours proposé une sorte de, de donnant-donnant, euh, c'est-à-dire euh, faire, faire les réformes, mais aussi euh, donner des, des protections aux gens pour ne pas euh, les, les laisser euh, au, au gré de la mondialisation. Euh, donc, donc euh, il n'est pas... Euh, bien sûr qu'il est marqué au business, euh, euh, banque, euh, etc., mais euh, en même temps, il propose des choses sur le, le, le modèle danois de, de flex sécurité. So his conception of reform has always been uh, tit for tat. You make some concessions to business, but in exchange you get some agreement from them on uh, protections to be accorded to those who are left behind by globalization. Believe it or not, um, that's it. So Francis, you need Granny had uh, explosions and massacres in his streets. And I'm asking to, to, to what degree uh, the difficult balance between public order and civil liberties is an issue in this campaign. Well, it was t today, I think, actually, in France, there were demonstrations uh, against Marine Le Pen, uh, but they were taken over by anarchists groups who fought the police and had to be dismantled. Riot units. Um, I think we were expecting more violence between the two rounds uh, with a very high Marine Le Pen, and the surprise was the absence of surprise at the public with her being so high. Um, that being said, in the last two years, there have been a lot of um, extremely violent uh, demonstrations and, and violently repressed demonstrations uh, both against the liberal law reform, uh, also student uh, unions being brutalized. So coming into the campaign, there were fears that with such a volatile society on the border of exploding, uh, one direction or another could be the match uh, that inflamed the social uh, situation. It's not, it's not happened yet. Mais, mais ce qui peut se passer, c'est un, un troisième tour social euh, après, après l'élection. Si euh, une partie de la gauche, et d'ailleurs les, les syndicats euh, ont commencé à se positionner comme ça, euh, en disant si Emmanuel Macron passe en force euh, via des ordonnances, il y aura des manifestations à l'automne et, et ça peut assez mal tourner euh, sur le plan institutionnel. Donc, so, il y a eu un talk de social third round si uh, uh, Macron tries to Uh, make labor code reforms by executive order, then the unions will uh, take position against that. Uh, I, I just wanted to say one thing about this policy area because I think it's a good uh, example of uh, Macron's tendency to have uh, en même temps positions. On the one hand, he made a very bold statement about uh, Angela Merkel's uh, generosity in opening the borders of Europe to Syrian refugees. He said, she saved the honor of Europe. Uh, one can't be more forthright than that. On the other hand, he says he will continue the state of emergency as long as necessary. He'll be tough on terrorism and so on. So this is uh, an example of his uh, having it both ways. Uh, one doesn't really know what to do. Uh, and one last point, I was going to answer to the question of, about uh, what will happen if Le Pen is elected. I think uh, you, you'll see something more than a social third round then. I think you'll actually see violence in the streets. and and resistance is regime. It's not going to be like Trump taking over the United States. Uh, France has a, a long history of uh, uh, not accepting the change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's assume that Macron wins 6040. Um, he starts to implement his program. My question is longer term. Uh, we've seen the National Front go from 8%, 15%, 20%, potentially 40% in the second round. 
what will it take for that score to go back to say 10 percent? Is it <laughs> is it just science fiction now? Will it take maybe a drop in unemployment or economic growth? Is it a matter of having a better narrative? You mentioned the narrative of the far right is clear and consistent. The narrative on the other side is a bit more wishy-washy. Or do we need maybe an external shock that unites the country to fight against Russia or something else? What do you think is the more likely path to uh, going back to those scores for the far right? Uh, I, I, uh, I think uh, it, it will never go back to 10%. What is more likely to happen is uh, some realignment on the right. You heard from uh, Cecile about the 30% of Fillon voters who are crossing over. We have the alliance between Dupont and Yon and uh, Le Pen. The barriers are breaking down. Uh, Sarkozy prepared the way for this with his uh, turn to the uh, far right under the uh, uh, advice of Patrick Wisson, who came from the far right. Uh, so I think uh, 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 th there's going to be some kind of realignment, which may even lead to a split in the Front National. We haven't uh, talked about the differences between Marine Le Pen and Marion Maréchal Le Pen, her niece, uh, who is much closer to the Fillon voters in, uh, in many ways. She's a practicing Catholic, uh, uh, is not favorable to same-sex marriage, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, if Marine Le Pen does really badly in this election, uh, Marion might make her move sooner, but I think Marion was preparing to uh, uh, vie for the leadership with her aunt at some point in the future. Uh, so uh, that might come about through some kind of fusion of, a, of the farthest right part of the Republicans and uh, the Marion wing of the, uh, uh, the Front National. I think that for the National Front to go back to maybe not 10% or 50%, we need to have Marine Le Pen in power at some point and see the consequences. I mean, she is presenting herself as, as a virgin who has never been in power, who is uncorrupted, even though she has six judicial affairs um, on her trail. And for people to, like, it is true that for a long time people um, voted National Front to protest against the statu quo, and today too, um, there's still a part of the vote which is an anti-establishment, anti-governing party uh, vote. So to, I mean, in the regional election, there was already this question, should there be a Republican front against the National Front in the North and in the South to prevent Marine Le Pen, respectively, and Marine Marche Le Pen from being the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, chief of the regions, and I think there was a sound argument uh, which could have been made to say, well, let the people have the choice they really want and try it out and see how it plays out to have a National Front leader at the head of six million people, which would be the size of a, a region. Uh, although, of course, today now it would be 65 million people who would be taking hostage. Uh, but I don't believe that it can go down to 10% just by um, economic um, embellishment. Uh, we actually, I think, are a country where there's at least a 15% incompressible far-right electorate who believes in the National Front narrative. Um, in Spain, they had worse unemployment, worse consequences from the financial crisis, and there's 0% for the far-right. So I think political culture plays a role. Je crois, crois qu'effectivement, la marée ne va pas se retirer du jour au lendemain. Euh, au premier tour, elle a eu plus de 6 millions de voix, 6, 6, 7. Euh, au deuxième tour, si elle est à 40%, ça va être 12 millions. On ne passe pas de 12 à 1 ou 2 millions. Le tide n'est pas encore reçu overnight. Uh, going from the first round to the second round, she's picking up a lot of votes. Uh, and uh, those are not going to be Thank you for your cultural translation work, really, in this uh, panel. This is not easy to convey what has to say, really, in terms of the specificities of it. And I'm part of that generation that did vote for Chirac in 2002. Uh, and I'm really grateful to you, Stéphane, for 
you know, explaining what those days are here. And I wonder how you read Mélenchon's silence about the second round, and also not just about Mélenchon's silence, but how that relates to what you that diagnosis as a failure of the left. Like I, I'm totally. I have no stakes there. I, I just want to hear what's the relationship between that silence and son, son, son silence. Son silence, il s'explique. Euh, euh, C'est ce que je disais tout à l'heure à, à propos du fait que, que le, il n'a pas envie de s'engager pour Macron à partir du moment où euh, plusieurs fois, euh, et notamment François Hollande, qu'il déteste par-dessus tout. Euh, et, et pour lui, Macron, c'est la continuation de Hollande. Donc dire voter Macron, c'est passer au-dessus de ses forces. Yeah, I think there's also a, some kind of electoral strategy here. Jean-Luc Mélenchon honestly did not expect to have 19% six months ago. And now he has managed to build a very strong force outside of political parties that gives him legitimacy to go into the Congress elections with his own candidates and impose on his super small ally now, the Communist Party, almost what he wants. And since he knows that his electorate is extremely diverse and uh, comes to him for different reasons, including total revulsion <coughs> against government parties and therefore Macron, saying, okay, now that I have galvanized you to be to to think you are a strong independent intelligent force I'm going to wash this away and tell you what to do would be to lose some potential voters for is it two weeks uh, two months from now so I think there's a way for him to to, to keep open the range of possibilities he can, he can abstain he can put no ballot in the envelope and still vote, he can put Macron, just don't vote Le Pen is the only um, um, kind of um, injunction that he had. All, all of that is true, uh, but I will add cynically that I think Mélenchon is on the ego trip of his life. That's true. <laughs> I think uh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> he never expected to be where he is and he's reluctant to give it up. That wasn't the question I was asking. I was asking a question about, you know, uh, the relationship between migration and Mélenchon's positioning on Syria, and about, you know, terrorism. Like, what is terrorism about? What's the relationship with Islam? What's Mélenchon's position on this? And what is the failure of the left? Is what I'm asking. Could you clarify the question because you asked both what is terrorism, is it connected, yeah. connected to Islam, or what is Melanchol's position again regarding to this? So is it about Melanchol the question or about something else? Yeah, I think that you've been framing Melanchol as more than he should have had in terms of votes, right? Yes, uh, that I said that, that uh, he, he originated of a strategic vote on the part of people on the left who did not want to vote for Macron. But this is some part of the left that didn't vote for Mélenchon for other reasons that are related to his position about Syria? Uh, well, Specifically? He, he backs Russia. Um, as, as it relates to French, you know, immigrate, migrations, new migrations, it's not unrelated to what you... Well, actually, so there are actually uh, statistics about what are the priorities of Mélenchon voters. It's not immigration. The priorities are purchasing power, social inequities, and I have it there. The other thing is unemployment. So migration is, is like 10% of Mélenchon voters think it's an important issue. It's not, and one thing to understand in general, <coughs> there is still a very, very strong divide between the left and the right, specifically on immigration. Left and 
uh, and far left uh, candidates and voters do not think that immigration is a big issue. They generally don't talk that much about it. And on the other hand, on the right and far right, immigration is a huge issue. Um, and it's really high in their priorities. But, but didn't Mélenchon keep a kind of an ambiguous stance of immigration? Didn't say, you know, immigrants are great, but at home? Well, at the same time, his platform, it says that he will uh, give papers yeah. to illegal immigrants. Yeah. So he's just trying to avoid the question. And yeah. it's typical of the left, actually. Il y a eu quand même un changement de discours par rapport à, à sa campagne de 2012 qui était beaucoup plus euh, dynamique, pro-immigration, pro euh, qui avait été couronnée par un discours à Marseille euh, une semaine avant le, le premier tour et qui lui avait coûté très cher parce qu'il était passé de 17 à 18% à 11%. Donc cette fois-ci, il en a tiré la leçon et il est resté beaucoup plus ambigu sur la question de l'immigration, ce qui lui a permis de capter une partie de l'électorat marine. So he lost support in 2012 for taking too much of a pro immigrant position, and uh, in this election, he backed uh, off. Okay, uh, this has been a wonderful uh, discussion. We've learned a lot, I've learned a lot, and I would like to thank uh, all our